Good evening and welcome to the local campaign, helping voters make an informed choice in the upcoming municipal elections. I'm Kim Wilson and I'll be your host this evening. Tonight we have the Waterloo Ward 7 debate. Waterloo's seventh ward is located in the south central portion of Waterloo. It is bordered by the city of Kitchener to the south, Weber Street to the east and University Ave West to the north and west. Some features within the ward are Uptown Waterloo, Wilfrid Laurier University, and Waterloo Park. There are five candidates vying for the council seat, which was formerly held by Melissa Durrell, and they are Devin McKenzie, Tenille Bonagor, Carol Parsons, Rami Saeed, and Elizabeth Sproul. Speaking order was drawn before the debate, so with her opening statements, here's Tenille Bonagor. And I'd like to thank Rogers, first of all, for hosting these debates and for everyone for tuning in. Uh, when I moved to Waterloo, I already knew that it was a great place. I married a fifth generation local and we were here all the time to see my stepsons. But it wasn't until I moved here that I discovered just how great it is. This is a city that welcomes new people and new ideas. It is a place that is full of potential and full of people who care. But it's also a city at a crossroads. As we build in and up, we need to decide what kind of city we're going to become. That's why I am running for Ward 7. We're going to get into the issues shortly, but first I want to tell you why I am the person for this job. I'm a senior science writer at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. Before that, I was an award-winning news journalist at the Globe and Mail and at newspapers in Australia. I have covered politics from municipal to federal levels. I'm comfortable with complexity. I can take in lots of information and listen to multiple points of view, and I'm not afraid to ask tough questions. As a community builder, I know how to rally people around an idea and then turn that into something real. I did that when I started a music festival in my neighborhood called the Grand Porch Party. I did it as the co-chair of Open Streets, and I've done it with community and environment groups across the region. I'm also a mum, so I know how important it is that we have great parks, that we have connected trails and affordable housing for all ages and all incomes. I love this city and I'm heavily invested in its future, just like you. And I want to work with you to build an uptown that we can all be part of and that we can all be proud of, an uptown that everyone can call home. Thank you. Thanks, Tanil. Rami? Thank you, Rogers, for hosting this debate. There's not many platforms at the municipal level in which we get to talk about the issues happening in our wards. So thank you greatly for that. And to everybody at home who's watching, thank you for actually being involved in our municipal politics. You know, it, it really shows that you care about our community. Many of you may actually remember me from four years ago when I ran for mayor of the city of Waterloo. What I can tell you is during that campaign, I learned a lot about what our city is and who we really want to be. And since then, I have fallen in love more and more with Waterloo every single day. I volunteer in Waterloo, especially in the Uptown Core. I'm the chair of the Uptown Vision Committee. This is a committee of council that comments on things such as development, our parks and recreation, and how we really move around Uptown as a whole. I'm on the board of the Uptown BIA. This is a group that works with our businesses to ensure prosperity through the Uptown Core, beautification, to make sure people actually want to come uptown and stay uptown as well. You know, beyond business and development, I also understand that arts and culture is a very important part of what makes the community whole. For reasons like that, you know, I volunteered for the Button Factory Arts. This organization has actually taught me a lot more about the arts and culture than I ever thought I could imagine. It shows how important arts are. This weekend alone, we have a new festival called Lumen coming up. It's been a combination between the city, the Button Factory, many local organizations, and the Uptown Waterloo BIA. We just got brand new lighting throughout all of Uptown Waterloo, and we're about to light it up this Saturday, and you should really come and check it out and see how Uptown Waterloo has changed over the past few years. Construction's behind us, and we're looking forward to a new prosperous core. I'm also a resident of Uptown Waterloo. I live at the corner of Caroline and Albert, and I've been here for over a decade. I'm a business owner of Patent Social, a local venue in which focuses on arts and entertainment, and brings in different local community groups in which wouldn't necessarily have a space. To reiterate that, I'm a volunteer, I'm a resident, I'm a business owner, and I'm a community builder. I look forward to answering any, many questions during this campaign, and I look forward to winning your vote for October 22nd. Thank you. Thanks, Rami. And next we go to, sorry, 
Um, Devin. Yes, Devin <laughs> McKenzie, <great>. yeah. <laughs> so my name is Devin McKenzie. I was born here in Kitchener-Waterloo, and for the past 29 years, I've had the opportunity of growing alongside this community. Both my parents moved here from Sarnia and Toronto to get an education at the University of Waterloo, where they then decided to start their first family home at Elgin Street in Ward 7. Seven years ago, I started my first business. It was at the corner of King and Princess, and eight months into operation, the roof collapsed due to a windstorm. After that, uh, I, putting that business back together, I then was faced with a challenge of long construction delays from the LRT and streetscape projects. Through perseverance and hard work, good financial planning, I've been able to expand my business into what it is today. I now own six storefronts in a four block stretch on King Street and employ over 100 employees, serving over 7,000 guests every week. My primary business though is in construction, having renovated over 12,000 square feet of commercial space in Waterloo last month alone. I look forward to sharing my qualifications, my opinions on the hot topics, and values with you throughout this debate. For more information on me, look up devinmckenzie.com and follow the hashtag VoteDevin7. Thank you. Thanks, Devin. Carol. Good evening, and thank you, Rogers, for hosting this debate, and to the viewers at home for tuning in. My name is Carol Parsons, and I'm looking forward to advocating on your behalf as City Councillor in Ward 7, Waterloo. I have lived in Waterloo since graduating from Laurier in 1989 and moved uptown as an empty nester in 2014. Professionally, I've worked in the insurance industry for almost three decades where I've learned the importance of respectful negotiation, the value of trusted relationships, and the importance of responsive service, skills that I will bring to my role as city councillor. Personally, I'm a longtime community volunteer, most recently a board chair for the United Way of Waterloo Region Communities, where I've learned the importance of effective community engagement. Ward 7 has seen many changes over the last few years. The LRT will soon be up and running. We've welcomed many new businesses uptown. The population has multiplied with multi-dwelling uh, buildings, and the, we've recently enjoyed the opening of the new promenade in Waterloo Park, but we still have a long way to go. I've had the pleasure of speaking with many residents, business owners, and community leaders over the last several months. And while most of them would agree that they support this change, they all agree that there's been challenges that have resulted because of this change. They're concerned with traffic that is being rerouted into neighborhoods um, like Streets William and Allen. They're concerned about the speed of traffic on Father David Bauer Drive. They're concerned about accessible transit for people with mobility issues. This is just the beginning. As City Councillor, I'm committed to making sure your voice matters. I will foster a more collaborative culture, prioritize thoughtful development that complements our neighbourhoods, and work to create a vibrant, connected, and engaged community for everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. And Elizabeth? Hello, I'm Elizabeth Sproul. <clears throat> I'd also like to thank Rogers and for hosting this debate tonight, and for you uh, viewers for tuning in. I've lived in Waterloo for 28 years and have raised three children with my husband, Peter Haney. I've been engaged in public service for many years. This includes my children's schools, the Waterloo District School Board, and community agencies such as Community Justice Initiatives, the Child Witness Centre, Horizon Family and Community Services, and the Centre in the Square. The reason why I'm running is that I love our city and I'd like to see it develop in a positive way. But there are challenges that need to be met caused by growth, intensification, and increased traffic. These are pressing issues that the Council will have to deal with. And I believe my skills as a lawyer, adjudicator, and professional mediator will be helpful to the next Council. While I think growth is essential, what is the City's vision? In talking to residents over the past weeks, many have expressed concern about how their City is growing and what is happening. It indicates that there is no clarity or shared vision. Why is there a disconnect between residents and the city? This needs to be addressed. I believe a councillor's primary role is to be a dedicated advocate for 
constituents and to be diligent in responding to their questions and concerns. I am eager to serve you and to address your concerns. I ask for your support on October 22nd. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. So to begin the question and answer portion of our debate, we'll now go to the Waterloo Chronicle reporter, Adam Jackson. Waterloo City Council recently approved variances for a condo development at 70 King Street North, the former Canada Post Office. There was, for various reasons, a decent amount of opposition to this decision. Do you agree with the decision? If not, what would you have done differently? And we'll start with you, Rami. Thank you very much for the question, Adam. So many of you know through the Uptown Vision Committee, this is something that we've been reviewing for about the past year or so. And I stood at City Council during that meeting and did stand in favor of this building. So let's talk about this building. By our new bylaw that was passed earlier that meeting, an 81 meter tower was approved for the back half. The front podium at four stories was okay. What was added on was a second tower closer to the front, a little bit behind the podium, in which was a little bit, was quite a bit taller than the standard height under the new bylaw. So again, 81 meters already at the back tower for the same building. Yes, this building is large and it's a bit different, but what I think we're building is the future of Uptown and this is a landmark property. There is almost no other property in Uptown that is even capable of achieving this. Whether they're on floodplains or the property sizes are just too small, this building is a little bit more monumental, but it's also representing what we want Uptown to be. So part of this building is again, what is the future? Now some people have compared this building to the Rim Park fiasco, which I you know, it, it, it shows a bit of a disconnect. Because Rim Park was a big mistake that the city of Waterloo made due to unfortunate circumstances, and which led us to an $80 million debt load on a $100 million project. This project has actually netted the city of Waterloo two and a half million dollars, not including our development fees, which will help with support of housing and different projects in the core as a whole. So two things very differently. What this project does offer as well is a steam building. So science, technology, entertainment, all in one building, in which we're looking at is almost a sports facility, where we're gonna find the best and the brightest in Waterloo, and we're gonna train them, we're gonna mentor them, and take them forward. An issue people were concerned about is during that meeting, there was a bit of a discrepancy about what was happening. And during that discrepancy, it wasn't about the project itself, it was about what the, the developer was gonna provide to the city. Initially, we were offered $2 million to go towards the STEAM project. During the meeting, they offered us one and a half million for the STEAM project, and a million dollar creditary note to the city of Waterloo to use wherever they wanted. Council decided to move forward on this project, but review that offer, because the offer was different, and in my opinion, it was better. And I do believe the city of Waterloo did go in the right direction, and I do believe that this is setting the benchmark of what we need in Uptown Waterloo. Thank you. Thanks, Rami. Devin. Yes. So this building's a tremendous opportunity for Uptown Waterloo. It offers an opportunity for new commercial space on the ground floor level. It offers the opportunity to already existing businesses to have new foot traffic. It also is crucial for Waterloo to focus on maintaining our farmlands in our surrounding region. We can't continue to develop in our residential urban sprawl matter. Eventually, we do need to build up. Now, this new commercial space, uh, I do believe it is a, a shock to many of the long-term residents, uh, but it is necessary. I personally uh, want to maintain more human scale along King Street, so I don't believe that they necessar necessarily should have approved the higher towers on the front side. Thank you. Thanks. And Karen? Very good question. Uh, definitely something we're hearing a lot about uh, in the community. And I have to be honest, I'm a little torn. I agree with Robbie that uh, it's great to have a landmark property in Uptown Waterloo. I look at downtown Kitchener and they've got the, the Google property and people are very excited about it. They've got some great community space. Um, so wonderful that we've got this landmark property in Uptown Waterloo and I'm definitely for um, the uh, involvement that the community will have, the ability to bring families into a space uh, to learn and to grow. I, I think where I'm really uh, a little bit more torn is the fact that the height of that development is really going to stand out. It's one thing to be a landmark, but it's another thing to stand out when you look at it and compare it to everything else that's within that uh, King Street uh, proper. So I think residents, um, again, are not against development. What they were concerned with is the fact that that development isn't respecting, in their opinions, their um, neighborhoods. They're concerned about uh, traffic. Um, intensification as well as um, more people living uptown. Um, I just 
also believe that there is due process and uh, people didn't feel like that due process was followed. Um, and, and again, change is, is happening and, and people aren't against it. I think it's just uh, the way it happened was um, you know, something that some people are having a hard time dealing with. Thanks. Thanks, Carol. Elizabeth? Um, I was not uh, for the decision to allow for the 11th uh, story tower at the front. That afternoon at 3 o'clock on the same day, uh, I think everyone knows that Council had considered the new comprehensive bylaw and that had been after uh, many years of consultation and input and at the end of the day it was concluded that what the residents wanted was that there's going to be four, a maximum of four uh, stories on the main street. So that happened in the afternoon so that you can understand that evening when that was not complied with, when Council agreed to go over that, it really raises a question is what is the point of input for residents if in fact even though it's codified in an actual a bylaw it still doesn't get adhered to. So I think that was the essential problem with the decision that it didn't comply with really what the residents had wanted and that seemed to be well known. The other issue I had with it was that this idea that you can agree to a part of a decision or part of an agreement without understanding the full details, it became quite apparent that there wasn't clarity as to what the uh, bonusing agreement would ha entail. And it was, a, in my opinion, a squandered opportunity to perhaps um, get for the city more than what was then being offered. And I don't believe in a negotiation that you give away the house and then say, how much do you want to pay for it? So from my perspective, I think that the city was not diligent in getting the details nailed down before they uh, entered into this agreement. And that is, again, uh, quite a, uh, concerning to residents. Thanks, Elizabeth. And to Neil. So I was at the council meeting when this decision went through. Um, and honestly, I support the podium. It is above the official plan height recommendations for King Street, but I think that the, the, the beauty and the intensity that that will bring to King Street was worth the slight increase for the podium. The rear tower on Regina is within zoning limits and you know, we need to intensify if we're going to protect our farmland and more importantly, or just as importantly, look after our water supply. My issue and the issue that I heard from a lot of residents was with the front tower on King Street. So that's the one that would take it to 11 storeys in total. A lot of the official voices of concern that were heard around that, that development were relating to the heritage. But what I was hearing from people on the street was they were just as concerned about human scale and breathability on King Street. Because when you look at it, Regina is zoned for, for towers and much of the uptown core is similarly designed for towers and to intensive development, which I support. But if we want King Street to be a place that is vibrant, where people want to linger and where people want to live, we need to have some place for them to actually relax and enjoy the city. So that's why I would have much preferred to see a stronger pushback to see if this development could go ahead while being closer in compliance with the official plan. The official plan is the document that citizens actually had a voice in making. So as a councillor, I would give it more credence than it appeared to have at that council meeting. Now, in council's defence, there was a lot of discussion before that meeting. So, you know, there was a lot of back and forth with the developer. We weren't privy to all of those discussions. But, you know, from what I saw on the night, I would have liked to see the official plan have a, a stronger place. Thanks, Tanil. For our next question, we go to the Greater Kitchener-Waterloo Chamber of Commerce, Vice President Art Sinclair. The recent provincial election uh, focused on two-way, all-day GO train service, which is widely supported throughout the region of Waterloo. What other transit and transportation projects should the cities and the region of Waterloo be working on? And we'll start with you, Devin. Waterloo needs to be focused on building business in its community where our residents can be working and playing in the same environment and not have to transport all the way to Toronto. I hope that Waterloo can build its business infrastructure uh, so that all of our residents can also work here 
and support our communities. The 401 obviously is uh, a long haul to drive to and from Toronto and it's interesting to see that we're putting so much uh, weight on public transportation when right around the corner we should be focusing about our 10-year plan when we have vehicles that can drive themselves instead of building billion dollar projects that might not be usable in the near future. Thank you. Thanks, Evan. Carol. So as a business professional who travels to Toronto on a regular basis, and that 401 is no longer an option, um, public transportation to Toronto is not convenient at all. Uh, Two-way all-day go transit is a must, and in my personal opinion, should have been here, or we should have been having these conversations um, many years ago. I personally don't believe that we have an option. I think we have to find a way to be able to have residents who live here traveling out of our city and residents who um, live out of our cities traveling into our city for work. We have to have a better way of getting them um, to and from where they are without having vehicles on that 401. Um, I agree that maybe we need to look at uh, something a little more progressive uh, because we do know that um, driverless vehicles are kind of on the horizon. Uh, but I also think that maybe we need to look at, you know, better ways of being able to fuel uh, the modes of transportation uh, that we need in order to get uh, people to and from um, different municipalities. So I do believe that we need a more efficient transportation system. Um, uh, Two-way all-day uh, go transit, in my personal opinion, is probably the fastest way for us to start moving people uh, more quickly uh, with maybe a more uh, progressive way of looking at it um, in the plans as well. Thanks. Thanks. Elizabeth? Um, I commuted for many years on the go and uh, I have to say that the two-way all day is something that would be just life-changing for a lot of people. We've heard from the tech industry the challenges they have getting people here and getting back and forth um, and it's essential. Many people don't use any train system today because or the go that exists even though we have two trains in and two trains back because if in fact you have a meeting at 12 o'clock and you don't want to spend the entire day in Toronto and you don't want to arrange to have a bus coming back then it makes sense to have that. But in terms of the question as to what other transportation when we look at our city um, we have the LRT hopefully getting up and running soon but really for many of our uh, constituents they don't have proper access so as we build out our transportation system we really have to keep in mind how is it we're going to get people from Laurelwood or Westvale or any communities to our uh, LRT to really make it function or is it simply for the people in the core? I think the idea was it's an asset that we all should be using and the infrastructure or the busing systems or whatever it is that we can develop to make it more meaningful uh, and useful is something we really do need to focus on as soon as possible. Thanks Elizabeth. Tania. So for transportation I think we would all be better off if we looked at moving people rather than just moving cars. So Go Transit, the expansion of that is definitely beyond late. Like we need this and we, we needed it yesterday. Um, but for other issues that we should be making a priority for the city and the region, you know, an integrated and strong bus grid to feed into the LRT is going to be essential to the LRT success. So I will work with my region counterparts to make sure that we are building a strong system that works for the people who are going to be using it. On top of that, I mean, we need to have safe cycling in this city. So a connected grid of cycling lanes that can take you safely from essentially like the university area of, of Waterloo to downtown Kitchener and beyond, it's essential. And these systems should be integrated so that they actually work well together. On top of that, you know, just if we're talking about getting around, like your own two feet is the first place to start. So having sidewalk infill is a huge priority for me. And I would also like to find out if we can do a sidewalk clearing proposal, like, um, study here. Kitchener decided not to do it. I'd like to find out if we can do it because if it's easy to get around, no matter what way you choose to travel, then life is better for everyone. Rami? So thank you for the question, Art, and the Chamber of Commerce. So I think we can all agree that two-way go is a great thing and that we need to get there and we're not there yet. But let's talk about what we as city councillors can do. So through my job as as chair of the Uptown Vision Committee, I can tell you that we are currently working on new methods to move around Uptown itself. 
know, that's really our focus right now as counselors, is what can we do uptown? So let's say you get off the LRT bus route. Now you want to go to the, you know, you want to go to your favorite store. It's a little bit farther away. You know, if you have a lunch break, you only have about an hour to get there, let alone eat. So one thing that we're trying to pilot right now is e-scooters through uptown Waterloo. We're working with the University of Waterloo currently to try to pilot them on their property, and hopefully with provincial legislation changes and with networking with our province themselves, we'll actually be able to see it on our, on our city streets. On top of that, let's talk about walking. Tanil makes a great point that we really should be clearing our sidewalks. And I can tell you that through our Uptown BIA, I have been a champion of pushing for our Uptown to actually start clearing the King Street corridor. You know, as a BIA, our focus is King Street. It's the beautification of how do we get our businesses to, be, to prosper. And that's a very great place to start for us because we can see tangible numbers that show whether or not people are coming Uptown Waterloo during the snowfalls. We just added large sidewalks to say that we are an accessible area, that wheelchairs can come through. But if these sidewalks aren't cleared, it's a moot point. So I can tell you, currently I've already been championing these goals, and I think you'll see some cool stuff coming up town within the next few weeks. Thank you. Adam. As part of an $11 million streetscape project, segregated bike lanes have been added to King Street. While some are happy, others are saying that the bike lanes should be protected from traffic by either bollards or some sort of physical barrier. Do you believe the city should alter what is currently there? We'll begin with Carol. Great question. Um, lots of people have been talking about uh, the bike lanes uptown. I actually was really excited to see um, just the other day, we finally have them painted green. Because um, I do think that when they first opened them up, it was really difficult for drivers um, to see. They had the images of the bikes on the, uh, the bike lanes, but it wasn't very obvious from a driver's perspective. Um, I also think that the timing was interesting because they had those um, streets open uh, last kind of late fall, early Christmas season where we were letting drivers park on those cycle lanes. So when they opened them up as cycle lanes um, earlier this summer, I think it was just confusing. So I think that what they've got now that it's quite bright and uh, green, I think will be um, effective. I think it's just going to take time for people to get used to it, and I would not propose that they do anything different at this point in time. Thanks, Carol. Elizabeth? Thank you. Um, as I understand it, there were some um, expertise involved in uh, the development or the design of the bike lanes. So I am a little puzzled that they haven't met expectations. My question is, assuming that everyone that was involved in it knew what they were doing and have designed something that is workable, that perhaps it's an educational um, situation, much so what Carol was alluding to. Uh, people have to get used to it. Car, uh, car owners and car parkers have to be considerate of it and have it on their mind and cyclists perhaps will get a little bit more confidence as, as our population um, gets in tune to how the new approach to the uptown and the cycle lanes. There is, I have to say, a little bit of inconsistency in the way it's not direct. There's some twists and turns and it may be at the end of the day for safety's sake something will have to be added. But I, at this m point in time, I said I'm not sure, given that they were designed by cyclists, um, that it should, that should work and we should let it see, let, wait and see how it goes. Thanks, Elizabeth. Tenille. So. Good infrastructure is not confusing. Safe streets are easy to navigate and easy to understand. If we have to launch a massive education project to just show people how to use infrastructure, then we haven't designed it well. Um, I think the bike lanes on King Street are a great start. It was excellent the city made that such a visible priority. And, you know, I don't think anyone is expecting the bike lane through King Street to be a high-speed cycling corridor. There is just too much traffic and too many pedestrians around to expect it to be like a high-traffic, high-speed thoroughfare. But what it will connect to is what's really interesting. So, Bol you asked specifically about bollards. I don't know if bollards per se are necessary. What I do know is that what we have is a good start. I would like to use it as essentially a test to see how it can be improved. Um, what it connects to though, will be higher speed, higher trafficked bike lanes in higher speed, higher trafficked roads. So I think there's going to be a case to be made for bollards or other physical separations in bike lanes in other parts of the ward and the city. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, when it comes down to it, 
we need to get around together, we need to get along together, and it needs to be safe for everyone. And I would like to see the city be responsive to users so that we're making strong infrastructure together. Thanks. Rami? Thank you. So I agree with our counterparts that there obviously has to be some research done. We know that next year we're starting construction from Bridgeport Road up to University. Much of this work was already supposed to be done, but due to unfortunate delays, we're doing it now. What we need to see first is let's see how it connects through. Let's see how traffic's moving. Let's give the businesses a bit of time to breathe after the last bits of construction and make sure that we're not shutting down their roads again as we enter this next phase of construction. You know, it has to be a partnership in which is community, has community benefits across all boards. Am I opposed to bollards? Not in the slightest, but I do think we need a lot more information. You know, there's no vertical signage yet, and we understand that people do still bike in the winter. So I do think that there's other areas we need to tackle first. Clarity, you know, when you look at Kitchener's downtown, you can tell it, it looks very similar for their parking structures on their King Street versus our bike lanes. So obviously there's a whole level of understanding what is what. Our markings on the bike lanes are only at the intersections. Maybe it's time we look at expanding that as well. I think education is a big piece, but if push comes to shove in the next year, ideally before anything bad happens, we'll have a better understanding of how people are moving, how traffic flows, and what is actually needed in those areas. Thank you. Devin. This is a prime example of the lack of planning from our city and them not consulting construction workers or anybody involved in that kind of design process. The bollards are absolutely something that's feasible, that we can accomplish in a quick and short timeline. The human protest of the ballers that where they stood out to protect other bikers was a great example that our community cares about this and wants to see it happen quickly. And it's not fair that we expect our education process to save lives when it comes down to pedestrian and cyclist safety. There's a huge disconnect when you're driving from Kit downtown Kitchener to uptown Waterloo. We can't expect drivers to cross the tracks and change their driving techniques. It's just not fair. It's unfair to, for all the cyclists, and it's also unfair for the drivers to have that stress added to their commute. Thank you. Thanks, Devin. Next question, Adam. In Waterloo Park's master plan, there is a long-term vision that includes the removal of the two baseball diamonds along Father David Bauer Drive. If the master plan is followed, those two diamonds would be replaced with essentially an empty field that would be used for festivals. Do you agree with this plan? If not, what is your vision for this part of the park? We'll begin with you, Elizabeth. Well, thank you. Um, I happened to watch the mayoral debate, and I understand from Mayor Jaworski that this is not going, they're not going to be replacing the ballparks. So I'm not sure, but I'll continue as if that's going I, to I, happen. I, I, I can elaborate. So that, um, it's still in the master plan. Uh, that that was that was his opinion based on uh, okay. based on the information. So the the master plan hasn't been changed. Correct. Well, there's a little bit of a concern for the people that live on Father Dav David Bauer Drive that if you uh, put the venue for outdoor festivals where the baseball diamonds are, it will be a noise concern for them for some time to come. There happens to be another, although uh, it's perhaps a not great shape uh, venue for. Uh, per outdoor performances which could be renovated. There seems to be a lot of people that actually use the baseball time diamonds uh, of all ages. Um, it's a sport we need to be encouraging, uh, sports we generally need to be encouraging to, for people to be active and it's convenient and well used. I'm not sure that uh, it the it's the perfect location for an outdoor uh, festival spot. I think that perhaps the baseball diamonds are uh, used by more individuals and on a more constant basis and so uh, I think that they should be left as is. Thanks Elizabeth. Tenille. So Waterloo Park is actually more sports oriented than most central urban parks. Uh, when you look at the park as a whole there are baseball diamonds elsewhere, there's a cricket pitch uh, which is great, there are soccer fields, there is actually a lot of amenity in the park as a whole. When it comes to those two particular diamonds and the Waterloo Park plan, uh, the, the plan was created a long time ago, to be honest, in the life of our, of our city. It was made in 2009. And frankly, the city has changed a lot and our priorities are changing now. So I, w I support the idea of creative reuse of parts of the park. Two baseball diamonds will be used by people who can afford to play the sport and who have access to those, you know, to that kind of stuff. A festival site 
will be used by probably more kinds of people of more income levels from more diverse backgrounds. That for me is what a park should be for. An inner urban park should be for everyone in the city, not the people that can afford to play a certain game. And I love sports, don't get me wrong. My first job was a sports reporter. So what I would wanna see is if we are going to move those baseball diamonds, let's move them somewhere excellent so that there is really strong access for kids and adults to still play. And we situate you know, the festival area of the park in a place that makes sense. The situation of it in the park plan I don't think it still holds up. I think we need to reassess that park plan and work out a better spot for the festival site. But I think overall, we should be thinking of the Waterloo Park as a place for all people, including people who play sports, but including people who don't. Thank you. Thanks, Chanel. Rami. So part of the understanding when we agreed to move the baseball diamonds and put the festival space there is that they would be relocated. As Dave Jaworski mentioned in his debate, and as Elizabeth mentioned, we lost the ability to move them to the location we wanted, so at this point, there actually is no sub new place for it. So at this moment, I'm not in favor of moving the baseball diamonds. I do, however, believe that we do re need to review the Waterloo Park Master Plan. Janelle made some great points that Waterloo has changed. That plan was from 2009. The cooperage wasn't really a thing then. A lot of the towers down the street didn't really exist. A lot of these new towers that are being proposed today weren't even idea ideas at that time. We have more people in this core, and with more density means different needs. I do believe that when we reviewed the master plan, we should look at what does the community really need. You know, we're about to dredge Silver Lake next year. The plan's already in place. The budget's already been approved. We're reviewing the park today. This council and the next council will have a lot of decision of what happens. And I think at that time is the time to make the decision of what is Waterloo Park? What are our needs? One thing I propose for Waterloo Park is to have an uh, off-leash dog park. As we build these higher towers, we're finding more residents are in denser conditions, and they're still having pets without backyards or anywhere to let their dogs run free. With smaller dogs, it may not be too big of an issue, but when you get these larger dogs in these small residences, one of my neighbors has two large Great Danes, for example. There's really nowhere for them to run free in Uptown Waterloo. We tell them to go to Bechtel Park. Well, if you're a transit user, like we're trying to get people in Uptown Waterloo to be, or if you travel by foot, Bechtel Park is not achievable unless you have a vehicle. So for me, I like to see a redo, redo of the master plan I'd like to really look at what we're doing, what our community needs, and ensure that we're best representing our constituents in Uptown Waterloo. Thank you. Thanks, Rami. Devin. I think it's important that we maintain Waterloo Park as a peaceful space. Uh, when I was speaking with the uh, people, the residents at Lutherwood Village the other day, they complained about loud music, and I think building a um, concert venue right beside those residences is, is kind of absurd. I'm surprised that also that in 2009, if this was being talked about, we're talking about planting some grass and we're still not complete that. Um, now, I believe that uh, Waterloo Park should be focused on completing the projects that it has laid out before starting new projects. Uh, we simply need to be focusing on utilizing the infrastructure that we've already built. The band shelter is greatly underutilized and it's steps away from those baseball diamonds. We need to be putting more programming behind that band shelter and focus on events using directional speakers so that we don't draw complaints from the Lutherwood Village residents. Thank you. Thanks, Devin. Carol. So interesting question. Thank you so much. Um, from what I understand, uh, that master plan, as everybody's already said, uh, that came out in 2009 or was approved in 2009, doesn't actually specifically say anything about the baseball diamonds. It talks about a festival space in Waterloo Park. Where that festival space goes, um, yet to be determined, um, the talk of putting it where the baseball diamonds um, currently are uh, definitely um, happened and I do think that and hope that there is uh, room for um, reevaluating that, uh, that discussion or that decision. I think that when you look at the festivals that we currently have in Waterloo, and I agree that we need to bring people together to celebrate, I, I love it, we've got the Jazz Festival and the Buskers Festival that happens in Uptown. Now those two events are actually sponsored by the Uptown BIA, and I don't believe that they're going to want those events coming into Waterloo Park, because the idea is they're Uptown so that you know people will be Uptown, spend money Uptown, visit the local restaurants Uptown. So when we look at the events that are actually happening in our park, we've got the Rib Festival that happened in the Baseball Diamonds, and that seemed to work out okay. 
and we had the 15th annual powwow that happened where the old band shell is. So there, if we're going to need to create a space for festivals, it means we're going to have to have more festivals. And where are we getting the resources to develop those festivals? When I asked Dave Jaworski, he um, you know, confirmed that we don't have the resources currently at City Hall to be able to put those types of festivals on. So I think that we basically have no reason to worry that those ball diamonds need to be relocated or moved at all, that we will continue to have festivals and we'll have discussions around where additional festivals can be uh, when we've got the resources to be able to manage them. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. And back to Adam. This past March represented the largest and most costly St. Patrick's Day celebration on and around Ezra Avenue. There is currently a plan in place to at least curtail the gathering within the next five years. Do you agree with the current approach? If not, what do you see as being the solution? We'll start with you, Tenille. I understand that this party is a concern for the people who live in the neighborhood and, neighborhood and the people who live across the city. Not only does it directly impact, impact the residents that are on the street or nearby, but it affects the, you know, the resources, police, ambulance, and all of the rest. Um, I, I'm very, very glad that there is a committee already working on it. And I understand that they're actually going to expedite proceedings. They were going to be meeting every two months. They've changed it so that they're going to be having meetings every month because they want to get to an answer quickly. And I really support that. Uh, when it, people often suggest having someone else run the event. And I would love to explore the idea of having service groups run the event. That way it could become, um, it could be organized. They, we could arrange things like you know, insurance and additional safety and security measures. And in the end, it could go towards you know, supporting and strengthening community that's already here. Uh, a lot of the students that I meet at the universities, they are passionate young people who want to be involved in their city. And this could actually be a great avenue to help open that door. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Robin? So this past year, approximately 20,000 plus people were on the street. Now, we can raise our hands and put fingers on whose fault it is, but at the end of the day, our local students aren't the ones causing the issues. Over 80% of charges were from people from out of Waterloo. Many people from out of Canada as a whole. Now, I believe in our police chief, Brian Larkin, and I do think that they have a plan. I've worked with some of these committees and seen that you know, it is a long-term item. You know, Ezra Street has been a party street for over 20 plus years. It absolutely now is the worst it's ever been, but we've already built this culture. People mention things such as Oktoberfest, of using that avenue as a way to kind of control this. But many of the people on the street aren't even of legal drinking age. All we're going to end up doing by fencing it off and making it mandated is push these people into other streets. That's going to be even harder to control. You know, I'm a neighbor of that neighborhood. I live right around the corner. I see it every St. Patrick's Day. I see people urinating in backyards. I see cans and bottles thrown across our streets and our lawns. So I get it, this is a major problem. But our community groups are working on this. Our students are engaged and they wanna make this better. We have to have faith in our police services and that's where I'll stand on this one. I know they have a five-year plan and I'd like to see them follow through with it. Thank you. Thanks, Rami. Devin? Yeah, I think it's interesting to see uh, politicians serving a four-year term making five-year promises. I'm the only candidate here that's run events, a uh, ticketed event, for 14,000 guests. So I have the experience to handle crowds of this size. Without incident, I've hosted these events, and I have a one-year solution, not a five-year, and I will remove the financial burden entirely from our Waterloo citizens' taxpaying dollars. With proper infrastructure, we can stop the public urination issues. And with proper fencing and proper security guards and organization and proper egress, we can reduce the incidence and number of ticket violations. Thank you. Carol. So I actually have gone on record saying that uh, I support um, having a place where the students can come together and celebrate on St. Patrick's Day. Um, I've talked to many students, uh, many community residents, and I'm really happy that for the most part, people are willing to have a conversation around how do we make this a safe event? Because I don't think anybody um, 
agrees that the event is going to go away. I think that, as Tanil mentioned, there is a sanctioned event task force that's already in place, and that includes representatives from the community, from the universities, from the city, and from police services. And I truly believe that together we will be able to find a way to make that event safe for everybody because it definitely is not going away. We tried a few years ago, I don't know if anybody remembers, that we put a tent up behind um, the Granite Club on Seagram Avenue and people came, but Ezra Street was still Ezra Street. And the other thing, as I've been talking to some university students, is they're, yes, they want to make sure it's safe because they themselves want to make sure that they feel safe um, on that street, but they, you know, hear people talk about the investment of um, you know dollars being spent on you know police servicing and ambulance etc but they also are saying that we are investing money in our community by spending in our restaurants and um, I, I think we just have to make sure that we're really careful uh, with how we work together to solve this um, but I do think that there's a way that we can do this and keep people on Ezra Street in a safe way. Thanks Carol. Elizabeth? The challenge with the Ezra party is that it's a, <clears throat> a rebel party and that's what makes it so appealing. A lot of young people come because they want to be at that place and get their picture taken and be part of what it is, as they say, a rebel party. I know this because I've talked to young people who have attended <clears throat> who would say it's not even that much fun but it's good to be there. Last year the uh, party cost our taxpayers $713,000. So if that's the budget, I would suggest if we're going to have to try and make it into some sort of party that they want to attend, it may have to be on the scale of something like a Woodstock, because I'm not sure that you can combat a rebel mentality with a, a <clears throat> some type of organized party. I would commend anyone that could come up with that solution. I think it's, it would be wonderful if it would go. My curiosity was, because I like to think more of the students that they have a social consciousness and I would like to say appeal to them and say could we get a movement going to say if you don't do the party if we can promise to pay some type of benefit to some group that they admire to say this is what you could do I would like to think the students would be cooperative and positive but honestly I'm not sure that that would be the case I've thought about this quite a bit and I know there's some good minds on it um, at for, but with a budget of $713,000, I'm, uh, I'm hopeful that we can come up to something at the end of the day. Changing the minds of young people is a challenge, um, and there's some precedents that like at Queen's University, the homecoming became an issue, and eventually they just had to cancel it altogether, and for years people still came. So my concern would be if we shut it down in one area, does it just pop up in the other? Um, and as I say, it's going to be a little challenge. Thanks, Elizabeth. That's an interesting question, and I look forward to seeing what that solution looks like in the next four years. So we'll, um, at this point, we'll move to our closing uh, remarks, and we're going to start with you, Elizabeth. Thank you. From what we've heard this evening from everyone, <coughs> it's clear that the city needs good leadership to address the challenges it faces. From my point of view, there's been much talk during the election about the importance of getting community input, and I agree. We need clarity as to what are our priorities. However, we have sought community input in the past on a variety of issues, most recently with respect to the Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw and the amendments to the official plan. But ultimately, this input did not appear to give it, be given any weight in the decision-making process. This is a failing that could and should be addressed. Otherwise, we are discouraging our residents from participating or engaging in municipal affairs, and that is to our loss. I love the city and its potential to be even a greater place to live. We are aware of our many strengths, the businesses, the academia, the tech, the innovation. Let's build on those strengths together. On October 22nd, I would greatly appreciate your support. Thanks, Elizabeth. And to you, Carol. So thanks again, Rogers, and to my other uh, candidates for participating so passionately. An open, collaborative, and innovative community is all about listening, connecting, and respecting. My vision is one that takes a holistic approach to community connectivity. So community connectivity is, occurs when you think beyond your boundaries and you bring your community leaders together to achieve greater success. My goal is to introduce a community advisory committee 
bringing together the appropriate people in a constructive way to share best practices, create authentic visions, and discuss strategies for addressing shared concerns. Because together, a bigger voice at City Hall can mean more impactful change. As City Councilor, I will also advocate for change that considers the needs of all our residents, protects the unique features of our great neighborhoods, and integrates our transportation system. On October 22nd, I ask for your support. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Carol. Devin. Thank you. If you want to find out more about me, look up my website at devinmckenzie.com. And if you'd like to give me a call, my phone number is 519-841-7536. I'm available anytime. Now, if you have a leak in your house uh, from a pipe, you're going to call a plumber. If you want to build a city, you're not going to hire a journalist. You're going to hire a contractor. If you want to build a city, you're not going to hire a lawyer. You're going to hire a contractor. If you want to build a city, you're definitely not going to hire an insurance broker. You're going to hire a contractor. We need to complete the projects that we've set out so that we can stop the rise of property tax and finish all the roads that we've just ripped up with no completion plan. We can't keep going back to our taxpayers and asking for more money every time we hit a construction delay. With my experience in construction and finance, we can complete the projects, bring them back on budget, and then continue to discuss furthering this community. Again, my phone number is 519-841-7536. Thank you. Thanks, Devin. Rami. And again, as Carol said, thank you to Rogers for hosting this. It's extremely important because it does get information out to the voters. And thank you to everybody who's standing beside me today. You know, it takes a lot of courage to stand up and talk to the public about what they think Waterloo is going to be and explain our vision of what Waterloo is. Because not everyone's always going to agree, and that's okay. Because the whole idea is to have conversation. Through this debate, I think I've shown that I've been dedicated to Uptown Waterloo over the past four years. When we talked about sidewalk clearing, I showed that I've been advocating through our BIA, and odds are you'll, you'll hear some more information about that soon. Through transportation, I've shown that we're working on different pilot projects to bring modes of transportation to Uptown Waterloo itself. When we talk about development, I've been involved. I've heard the issues. I've been on the boards and talking with the developers about how we can change things. A great example being the old brick brewery, where they were going to put garbage disposals on the Caroline side and just storefronts on the King Street side. Through the Uptown Vision Committee, we got the developer to work with us and agree that Caroline is becoming an active road and that both sides of that building should be street fronts. Uptown Waterloo is where I call home. It's where I've opened my business, and it's where I plan to be for a very long time. So on October 22nd, I ask you for your vote. I ask you to vote for somebody who's been involved, who's been on the committees, and who has fought for Uptown Waterloo year after year. Thank you very much for your time, and thank you for welcoming me into your homes. Good night. Thanks, Rami. Tenille. How do we build a city that still feels like home? That's the key question this election. Waterloo is growing in and up and you should have a voice in how that happens. As your councillor for Ward 7, I will work with you for healthy growth that makes room for new uptowners without overwhelming neighbourhoods. I will work with you to advocate for a diverse uptown economy where unique local businesses can thrive. I will work with you to push for more parks connected trails, vibrant arts, and strong community programming for all ages and incomes. And I will adopt a people-centered approach to council's decision-making so that all of our effort is focused on you. Too often, we get caught up in trying to work out what's smart and clever, and we don't consider what is wise. That's what I would like to bring to City Hall. I want to embrace the wisdom that takes the long view, that listens to multiple points of view, and that works together to build a healthy future for everyone. Change brings opportunity, and this is our chance to work together to make sure that Uptown remains a place that everyone can call home. My name is Tenille Bonagor. Please vote for me on October 22nd. Thanks, Tenille. And I'd like to thank all of the Ward 7 candidates for participating in tonight's debate. And be sure to tune in on October 22nd to Rogers TV for up-to-the-minute up results. Thanks for watching and have a good night.